Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. My name is uh, David London. I am the Chief Experience Officer uh, at The Peel, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's lunchtime uh, film screening, a double header of uh, uh, two films, one by any means necessary and not just a game. And we're very excited to have one of the filmmakers here with us um, as well. And in just a moment, I will introduce Shante Daniels, the executive director um, of the uh, Peel. And be before I do, um, uh, for those of you who don't know that, the Peel is the oldest uh, museum building in America, and it's currently being uh, renovated and relaunched as a home for Baltimore stories. And today's screening is so exciting because uh, we have two incredible Baltimore stories to share with you uh, uh, this afternoon. The event today will last about one hour uh, long, exactly one hour long, and uh, you will notice to the uh, right of the player on the Peel's website is a chat box. You can feel free to leave questions and comments in that uh, chat box. Um, however, we do not uh, foresee that we will have any time at the end of the presentation to get to those questions. However, any questions that are asked, we will uh, get those answered and um, add them to the event page and I believe distribute them through our a weekly newsletter as well. So please do um, uh, type your questions and comments into that chat box and you'll just have to hang tight a little bit to get your responses. Uh, we have several accessibility features at play today. Uh, you will see uh, to my right on the screen, we have Rory providing uh, American Sign Language interpretation and behind the scenes today, we have Jenna who is providing live cart uh, transcriptions. Um, which uh, you can see both built into the YouTube player as well as directly uh, below the YouTube uh, player in a separate feed. If you would like a, a transcription of today's presentation, one can be requested uh, by emailing access at thepeelcenter.org. That is also the email address that uh, you can um, uh, that you can email if you uh, have any questions about further accessibility um, or ideas of how we can improve our accessibility options. Additionally, if you have any questions during the day about the presentation, if you're encountering technical difficulties, you can email us at online at thepeelcenter.org. You can also contact us through social media. We're uh, at, at The Peel on Facebook and Twitter and The Peel Baltimore on Instagram. Lastly, uh, since I mentioned uh, any technical difficulties, um, although we are continually doing our best to improve uh, our systems here to be able to broadcast out into the world, in the uh, rare occurrence that we do encounter technical difficulty, just bear with us a moment. If for some reason the stream cuts out, you might have to reload your page. We don't foresee any of that happening, but uh, just in case, just uh, continue to watch the page you're looking at now on the Peel's website, and we will provide any additional instruction as needed. But once again, uh, we don't foresee that being necessary. We'd like to begin this event as we begin every event by acknowledging with humility that the lands where the Peel and Baltimore is situated today are the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock indigenous peoples. The vast coastal area today known as Baltimore City, Maryland, sustained indigenous peoples until the arrival of Europeans beginning in the 1600s. Over the next 400 years, many Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock communities were decimated, absorbed by larger villages or tribes, and or forced by the U.S. federal government to move beyond the Mississippi River with larger tribes. Since then, other tribal peoples have moved here in diaspora, including Lumbee peoples. On January 9, 2012, two tribes of Piscataway, the Piscataway Kanoi Tribe and the Piscataway Indian Nation, became the first tribes recognized by the state of Maryland. In 2017, the state also recognized the Akahanic Indian tribe. We acknowledge that the Peel stands on stolen lands. And I would also like to acknowledge that this history was adapted from an original text authored by Ryan A. Coons, Peter Dayton, and Ashley Miller of the Lumbee tribe. It is now my pleasure to hand the uh, screen over uh, to Shante Daniels, who I may have misidentified her title. I don't know what I said. Uh, however, she is the executive director of the Baltimore National Heritage Area and uh, our core partner in uh, the 
uh, more than history lecture series of which today's program is part of. So give me just a moment to bring her over here. Shantae, thank you so much for uh, working with us and for being here today. And I will hand it over all to you and uh, enjoy the. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first of a three-part lunchtime series, It's More Than History. As David mentioned, my name is Shantae Daniels and I'm the executive director of the Baltimore National Heritage Area. BNA looks to promote the historic neighborhoods and cultural treasures of Baltimore City. Each month, It's More Than History, in partnership with the Peel Center for Baltimore History and Architecture, will take on a topic that looks to shed a light, let shed light on a bit of a little of little known history and culture of the people, places, and institutions that make Baltimore City like different than and unique than any other. This month, we are focusing on two short films that tell two very unique stories of Baltimore youth. By any means necessary, stories of survival, which was produced by BNHA, and it's not a game produced by Just Stunt Productions and Tender Bridge. Both short films look to provide a different take on what being young and black in Baltimore is like through the eyes of the squeegee youth and the youth hockey team, the banners. Prepare to learn something new and please let others know about these short films. For more information on the films and the initiatives of the Baltimore National Heritage Area, Visit us at explorebaltimore.org. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at bmorha. Please enjoy the films and thank you for participating today. who had to do a little bit more to make it, to make ends meet. Living in economic poverty requires great individual effort, physical as well as psychological. People had to improvise. People had to hustle in ways others, their contemporaries, even those looking back, might find curious. That has certainly been true across Baltimore's history. This city really began to grow not long after the American Revolution. In the 18th century, many people made opportunities when they had to have them. There was a need, for example, for those to do the demanding physical work related to clearing land for roads and homes and businesses. Those who could and would move materials that raised this burgeoning city, quite literally the timber and the bricks, the digging and the dredging, the lifting and the carry. This work was not often secure work. A job one day didn't always mean a job the next, but people did the work. Though some were compelled by force, more were compelled to this sort of work by dire personal circumstance. After the Civil War, the city's place as a bustling American metropolis was well established. Yet even amid a highly organized workforce, social structures and personal circumstance meant that some Baltimoreans in need of a living had to improvise. City streets teemed with hucksters and hawkers offering all sorts of wares and services for sale, while carters for hire and domestics offering work for pay were seen throughout the city of Baltimore. Across all of this time, the keys remained the same for those most vulnerable. Determination, improvisation, entrepreneurial spirit. By the early 20th century, in fact, even for those shut out by discrimination from the lucrative opportunities cleaning up after the great Baltimore fire in 1904, there were ways to be found to help themselves as they made a few dollars here and there hauling away debris or performing some other menial, often odious service for pay. In the normal course of the early 20th century, those who existed on the fringes of the formal labor markets 
continued to find ways to meet their needs, to make ends meet as they could. Young women congregated on street corners near busy intersections uptown, hoping to be selected by passersby for the opportunity to earn a day's living at day's work, cleaning and doing laundry in someone else's home. For their chance, young men offered themselves and their labor for yard work, or perhaps found themselves downtown to the Light Street Corridor, where they might earn a menial day's wage, unloading the great cargoes coming into the harbor from around the world. In the modern day, despite the establishment of social safety nets, people fall through. So, as did others before them, people look to meet their needs through hustle, through work. Often, this is low skill work, almost always low entry cost work. It is not glamorous, nor is it especially fulfilling. But then there's also something of a tradition, something American in that very old notion of finding a way. We can see Baltimore's so-called squeegee boys in this tradition, perhaps. Known around the city since at least the 1980s, squeegee services and other on-demand street services have been peddled in urban environments, not only in American cities, but also in England, Ireland, and Canada. Unlike suburban youngsters who offer to cut grass or shovel snow, squeegee boys downtown get mixed reactions from their fellow citizens. But we might try to understand them in the light of history. And in this moment, as people trying to make ends meet, to work, to improve their circumstance, if only a little, by their own hand. But more than anything, perhaps we should take them at their word. Listen to what they have to say. Many of the young people don't realize the historical voices with which they speak, or that their intentions to better themselves by any means necessary reflect the values and entrepreneurial impulses that rest deep within the traditions of Baltimore and the nation. I started um, because I was homeless and um, my friend, I had a girlfriend and we were both homeless <laughs> and my friend, um, he squeegeed and I didn't know, you know, like what that even was. And he told me that it's a good way to make money and, um, Long story short, I didn't believe him, but I, then I watched and saw how much money he made, and um, I I tried it, and um, I, I made a little bit more than he made that day. So after that day, I just I didn't I didn't stop. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the first time I did squeezing, I was like I was like fourteen years old. I was young for my my homeboy put me on to it. So he taught me, he was like, yeah, he was washing cars and all that. So I said, all right, I'll go with you. So we went up to a block over West. It was over West. Bro. I made like $40. I, I was surprised that I even made $40. So I'm like, oh yeah, that's all I need. That's all I need. I'm gone. So ever since then, I'm like, with well, the money coming like that, I know I can make more. So I screamed, 
You feel me? Went back out there the next day, made a hundred. I'm like, oh yeah, this definitely gonna work out for me. So ever since then, I've just been doing it and I've been rocking out, doing what I gotta do. What started me in the business was that it was problems going on in the household. So I seemed though that was a good little hustle to go out there, sell water, squeegee, just to put a little bit of more money in the house, just to help out. I actually used to boost like stores and all that. I figured this is the easier and better way because it's not breaking the no law, but now they're trying to make it that way. So robbing people, stealing, not knowing if I be caught or not, scared. People going to come get me. Cops might get me. I might get shot today or tomorrow, you know. Stealing cars, driving them, you know, it was just like a lot. We ain't harming nobody, we ain't hurting nobody. We keep all the young kids and get them out the streets to give them something to do so they can make a couple of dollars. Because if they're not doing nothing, they're going to do violent things because they, they don't have nothing to do. So summertime, we all grab them all up and bring them to the squeegee block to make them a couple of dollars. That's why I don't be the violence is low and everybody got something to do. They focus. They ain't worrying about doing nonsense. And was a squeegee boy for about 83, 84, 85, about four years. Squeegeeing was one of the great gravitational pulls that kept me out of becoming from thievery, robbery, or any other negative element that could have pushed me in that direction. It kept me hostage in a positive way. It kept me hostage in a positive way. And I was appreciating the spirit of entrepreneurship that lived inside of it. And I was praying and hoping that it would evolve. You see the whole world, basically, you feel me? It's like, you feel me? It's better out here. You run into people you don't, you least suspect. We run into Brooklyn Br Br players, we run into all your players, we run into poor and people and all that, like, you feel me? People y'all, we least suspect, we run into, we run into, for, get their business card, you feel me, and all that. Like. I think it, it, it teaches them how to be um, independent. It teaches them how to make their own money. You can take something negative and turn it into a positive thing. You know, you definitely come in contact with so many people. You have conversations with people. You know, it's 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 really good for um, uh, a child that hasn't had a real job yet. I think it's good for them. Some people tell us they don't like us. They be like, yeah, I don't like what y'all doing and, and this, this, and the third. And I just talk to them how they talk to me. But just, I'm just, you feel me? I'm just getting disrespectful, but just still talking. I'm just saying, okay, but I'm still getting money at the end of the day. You never know, I'll probably make more than you at the end of the day. Everybody think we bad, but we not. It's not all of us. I first started squeegeeing um, by Baltimore Street, by like Shot Tower. And I mean, those, those kids down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, under the bridge. They are like, Crazy. We be trying to say something to them when they get a, when people tell them no and they get aggressive, it don't work at all. Like if you working, if you've been at a hotel and people being nasty, you can't be nasty back there. And we gotta think about your job at the end of the day. I don't think it's right. You ask me, I don't. I don't think that's right because number one, you stopping other people from getting money. Even if they do got it, they don't have to give it to you. They're gonna call the police on you. There's a lot of crazy people. And there's a lot of cool people out here. So stick to your mindset, your business mindset, and get your job done. You got some some people that'll pull up and they and they be going through stuff. They take their anger out on us. I had a gun pulled out on me because I sprayed a guy's window. Yes. I understand people be doing bad things, but you gotta understand where they coming from. It's not always us, but sometimes it is. You get what I'm saying? Sometimes we wake up on the wrong side of the bed and go out and do some crazy stuff. But like I said, it's not always us. I just want to tell all our squeegee kids in Baltimore City, any other state, anywhere, don't let your pride get in the way. Somebody be disrespectful, walk straight off on them, or just hit them with respect. Respect kills more than disrespect because it's going to hurt you to disrespect somebody else. You're really going to think. But you can sit there and laugh walking off. you already big, bro. Alrighty, have a blessed day. Come back and holler at me. I'm here, big bro.
don't hurt to be respectful. Just don't let your pride get in the way. I hate when people pull up on me saying, oh, you're going to stab me up. Where that come from? There's always bad apples, uh, and everybody always perceive it as spoiling the whole bunch. When it's not the whole bunch, right, that's actually uh, demonstrating what the two bad apples are demonstrating. <laughs> Whether the city likes it or not, <laughs> squeegee boys are the unofficial ambassadors to the city. You're driving the seat. That's the first person you see. You're driving along. You stop, and it's a squeegee boy. That's the first person you see from the county. So, and that's their first image. So, improve that image. If you can't assist or you can't uplift, then try your best to do nothing. Don't do anything to harm or hurt their situation by creating some nasty story that doesn't exist and you didn't take the time to speak with them to see that they are human just like you. <laughs> One unique aspect of Baltimore uh, that Baltimore possess that's a little different than other cities, right, is packing. <laughs> People talk about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. That's the absolute definition. You know, you created an economic viability where there was none. You, come, you, know, you get a hack. It's like uh, instead of getting a taxi cab or calling Lyft the Uber, right? Baltimore have a historical hacking process, whereas though it's a form of transportation that came out of the veins in the spirit of Baltimore City. Squeegeeing is another historical factor that's a part of the generation that I come out of and a generation that's out here right now, right? That's very unique in the historical elements of what we did through our struggle and through our journey. You know, you have people that are homeless, you have people that have no family, you know, and um, you have people on drugs, you know, a lot of us are on drugs. Like I was living with my, uh, my aunt, she used to abuse me. She used to hit me with pans and extension cords. So one day I just left. My family wouldn't even help me. Yeah, I lost both of my parents in 2012, and um, I first started getting high when I was like 21, and um, after I dropped out of college, and I started getting high, and I lost my apartment. I had my own apartment and stuff, and um, like life just really got hard. They all know four or five of their friends have been shot. The summer, I knew four guys. Uh, well, now it was five guys, because yesterday was another one that got shot, uh, that had been killed this, just this summer. And these guys want to stay out of the drug business. They don't want to do robberies. So squeegee is really their only option for making a living right now. We need this to eat, survive, all that. I'm homeless at this moment. I don't have nothing. I'm out. I sleep outside and everything. So this is the way that I live. This is how I survive. Shit happens, excuse my language, stuff happens, you know, and you know, I just want people to stop judging and stop being um, as rude as they are. Like it's, we already going through our own struggles. So when they come through and they cussing us out and treating us like we dirt, that just makes life so much harder, you know? But then you have really good people that come through. Like, I have customers that come through, like, here, take $20, $10, you know, like, and I don't even have to touch that car. A great deal of us in Baltimore are living literally from one paycheck to the next. And what if something catastrophic were to happen? Would it not be us, homeless, and in a position where we had to do something in order to survive. One of the kids the other day, I was driving some kids to school and it, one of the boys was saying, I need to get some money. I think I'll rob somebody. And the other kids were saying, are you kidding? That's, you, you'll get arrested, you know, you'll get in trouble. He says, no, 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 it's a win-win situation. You either get money or you get arrested and they take care of you. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm 14. 
and my brothers and sisters who are older than me, right? They're getting older. The, the hunger within my home is now growing, and now the opportunity and the resources that I see visually are deteriorating. And the only thing that's holding me right now in a positive way is the squeegee principle. Because inside of that principle, right, is a is, is spiritual principles inside of that squeegee process. One of them, right, cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> The thing about squeegeeing is you know you're going to make some money. A Ravens player came through and gave me a $50 bill. That's how I knew it was the best deal. When I seen a Ravens player come through, give me a $50 bill, it hit me with, this your lucky day. $100 bill from an old white woman on Christmas Day. Man, on the best day, especially like on a Friday, Saturday. He had that deep voice. He kept saying, I'm a Ravens player. You feel me? So I, I, I was just so happy when he gave me the money for where I forgot his name. I was just so excited for him, jumping around and all that for real. All right, $100, 75 my best day was 350. And the way that came is because I was out where it been for. I came out early. Every day you come out early is 250, 300 guaranteed. And I ain't even gonna play with it. Cause I'm a real hustler. The people that's really out here hustling, they gonna really make what they need to make when they're mind tour. It was a late night and I made $60 for one dude and I was so happy. He gave me 320s. Mm. I acted like it was a dollar, you know. <laughs> May I get another dollar? I gotta get my baby some pampers. No, they're gonna go, I ain't got no babies. But he said, look at your hand. I looked at my hand. I renewed it was. So I was excited. I was excited when I got it. I saw early in the morning, like 7. I saw this like 6, 7 in the evening. I make three, $400. Easy. When I finish the interview, I'm out here to make another $150. It's just a hustle. People like saying the hustle and hard work. If you, they see the hard work and they see you out here every day putting your effort into it, your hard work, blood, sweat, and tears, people going to come through and look out for you. Good things to happen to those who help work hard. My dream job, uh, I want to be a lawyer because people be getting convicted for nothing. Then they be in jail for years. Then when they come home, they ain't got nobody. I just like helping people. I want to play for the Ravens. I ain't going to lie. I want to be an actress. I always wanted to be like in Hollywood and stuff like that, like, I just feel like I should just be famous. I'll be rapping for real. Big Savage on YouTube. I'm coming soon. I, I always wanted to be a mechanical engineer. I used to take my game systems apart, figure out what's wrong with them, take the other pieces from my game system, put it together, make it work again. I always wanted to be my own boss, because I always been my own boss. Every lawyer, you feel me? The thing I did, I was my own boss. I'm my own father, you feel me? If, if it is still going to be around, when the squeegee kids come around, I would like to be a mentor for them. I'd be trying to mentor kids and stuff like that. Saving people life, when I was younger, that was my thing, for real. My first time losing a close person to me wasn't in my family, for real. So after that, for real, it was like, it, that really hit me, you feel me? So ever since then, I'd be like, get tired of saying people die, for real. So why not help each other out? Don't be scared of these guys. These are the nicest kids in the inner city. These are the good guys. Smile at them. Give them, you know, let them know that if you don't have any money or you don't want to pay them, just say, I don't have any money today, but I love you guys. You know, really appreciate you. Give them a big smile. These guys are emotionally, you know, isolated. They don't have a support family. And that emotional support of somebody in the car saying, I don't have any money, but I love you guys, is really going to emotionally help them. We need help. 
So don't treat me like trash because I need you out. Accept me for who I am. I don't care if you got money or not. Just accept me for who I am. The only thing I want is for the community to move forward. And particularly our young generation, right, to take it to the next step. And guess what? Before my eyes close and our eyes close, right, we're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. What we're doing is we're dealing with a lot of attorneys and putting all this on paperwork so we can get a grant and open up this building right here for $10,000 and turn it into a car wash. Or that building over there. So I was in and out jails ever since juvenile. And this here actually changed me. I just want people to know that, like, I'm so sweet. I just want people to know that I ain't a bad kid. I only do bad when bad come to me. That's all. And all the squeegee kids are good people. We all have hearts. We appreciate y'all for y'all coming out here and appreciating what we do and try to spread light on the situation from we know what's going on, but to show them how it really is on the other side of the shoe. So we appreciate y'all for doing what y'all do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I thank y'all brothers for coming out, supporting the brothers. I hope that our documentary go a long way, and I hope it go a long way with us that it help us out. To get off the corners. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. It's a rap, people. <laughs> Y'all have made my day. Sample of a freestyle or something? Uh, oh, I ain't got no clean freestyle. See, look, all profanity where I'm from. <laughs> yeah. You talking about how we gonna make it? How we gonna make it? All the time. We gonna make it. Oh, I'm gonna make it for real. Well, we gonna make it as a team by keep calculating more green by keep coming out every morning, making everything. <laughs> okay, it's hard for real, for real. I gotta catch it, but yeah, we swing up money to money through Sun money to money. Sunday. Yeah, straight up. That's what we doing. No days off. Never a day off. We double low at number ten. Shantae, your microphone is muted, so we were unable to hear you. So I'm going to ask that you unmute uh, yourself and um, repeat what you just said, if that's all right. I apologize. Well, I hope you appreciate it and can get a little bit more understanding of By Any Means Necessary. Our next film is produced by Just Stunt Productions. Um, Miles Banks is the uh, producer, and he was the uh, filmmaker with Tinderbridge. So we are now going to look at not just a game, which also uh, has the appearance of one of the young men that was in the earlier film, Savage. So it's not just a game. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Miles Banks, and I am the owner of Just Stunt Productions, LLC. Our company specializes in motivational and faith-based content. And to just give everybody a bit of a backstory, I was actually finishing up a show in Atlanta when I got a call from Noel Acton, the director of Tinderbridge. And he spoke about a young man named Savage. He told me that Savage didn't really have a strong support system, but he had a tremendous amount of work ethic and he had a willingness to just win in life. So um, when Noel and I sat down and we talked about you know, creating a film, 
we realized that the film needed to be about Savage and to really tell his story. And basically, and, and essentially, the, the, the film is about a young man that initially didn't have a great start in life, but because of his you know, determination, his faith, and his willingness to get things done, he is now a hero and a success story. So without further ado, please enjoy my recent film entitled, Not Just a Game, The Story of Savage. Thank you. Instead of just quiet, we're not just, uh, yeah. we're trying to stay out of trouble and stuff like that. But you get it, you get it. Yeah, that's why I'm here. You could do anything you put your mind to. Just constant will to keep getting better and keep going, it's, it's awesome. And I want to see wherever you go in life and be there for whatever you do. I do what I do to stay out of the way and don't die. You know what I'm saying? I know a lot of homeboys and friends and family that is dead over the other side of the lifestyle, you know what I'm saying? Choosing the good side for a reason. A lot of people act like they don't see it, but definitely, definitely trying my best to do good. You know what I'm saying? When you do good, that's when wrong get to get it through your way. You know what I'm saying? But you gotta learn how to block it out the way. My name is Savage. I'm from Baltimore, for real, for real. I'm out here living right, fighting all the negativity. I started for real, started over West for real, for real. Over West, I was getting abused a lot. I caught like five, six charges, for like five, six, seven charges for real. The judge told me in order to move my mother, I had to calm all that down for real. So they, they let me move my mother. I wind up finding a hustle that was squeezing. I'm, as a matter of fact, we was in school. It was me and my brother. I'm like, yo, trying to, like, trying to go do something to get some money to do or something. He like, yeah, it's, it's whatever for real. I'm, but I already knew that I already knew that I could squeeze because I used to do it over West for real. But I never took it serious because everybody in my school was clowning me for doing it for real. So I left it alone. So when I got over east, I, didn't, I probably don't even see everybody over there for real, for real. Plus, I live over here now. What I'm, what I'm worried about, put the next person safe for real. So long as doing short, man, my brother, we did that. That's thing you know, ever since that day, we just been on a squeegee block because we saying that it's no trouble for real. Only way it's trouble is if you make it trouble. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, honey. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Thank you, sweetheart. Have a great and blessed day. Absolutely. One year, we started like really recruiting people. At first, we didn't want to recruit nobody. For the simple fact, a lot of people mess a lot of things up. One bad apple can spoil the bunch. So we started recruiting people that we knew. He probably cool, so I got faith in him. He ain't going to do nothing to mess the block up. Long story short, my man is Nick Rock. He, he wound up telling us about no... Then Noel came around for real. And then man, Noel got cool. I'm Noel Acton, I'm the director of Tender Bridge. Uh, I've been working with the inner city kids in East Baltimore for the last 17 years. And one of the kids that I met recently was Savage. I've been working with some of the squeegee boys on Orleans and Gay Street with your baby bookings, basically teaching them that 
being customer friendly helps them make more money. I appreciate it too, man. Thank you, sweetheart. Have a great and blessed day. I made name tags for them, made business cards for them, helped them write some rules and things like that. Then one day we was on the squeegee block and no one came to asking us, asking us, do we want to go try out for uh, hockey equipment or something like that? And when I heard equipment, I thought about football. So I said, you don't have to know how to skate. We've got a lot of coaches to teach you. Come in and learn to play hockey. Then my homeboy was telling me, like, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Like, I'll be having fun doing it, so I know you're going to have fun doing it for real. Then I'm like, yeah, and if I do have fun doing it, I'm going to be nicer than you. So he came and got started, and he just took off. I first met Savage at a BTI meeting. We um, He came in. We, we had already had a couple of sessions. So uh, he was kind of uh, the new guy in. As we break down in the one-on-one -on -one sessions, he opened up a little bit more. When you try to do good, everything go left. Stuff just fall downhill. Start getting put out the house now. Damn, how am I getting put out the house and trying to do good? If I still was doing what I used to do, I wouldn't even be in the house. I'd be locked up right now. See what I'm saying? So, man, I got older. Like, yo, this shit's getting old and it's getting weak. Time to make something change. Like something got to change for real, for real. He didn't come the first day. It went like two or three weeks before he came. And then he said, yeah, I think I'll try it. And we chatted a little bit. I had an opportunity to help him find all his gear. Me and Noel, we, we're the Hound County equipment manager. So we get everybody organized with their equipment. I wind up getting uh, my equipment and all that. I get to say how everything is. I wind up going to practice. A couple of the practices, I started liking it. I'm like, oh, so that's how it's going. That's how it's going down for real. He was very interested. He really wanted to learn hockey, and he threw himself, you know, full force into it. Maybe a little bit too fast because he was, he was uh, trying to tripping over himself when he first started. And when I was playing around skating, I ain't falling not one time. But when I was down skating with the hockey equipment and all that, I was falling a couple times for real. I mean, a couple coaches. It took a couple coaches to uh, try to help me, but it was only Coach Taylor that was really giving me the real help for real. For real. I. Uh, First met Savage, I think it was the second or third week of the season, showed up and Noel took me out and told him to work with me one-on-one -on -one for a little bit. Instead of him telling you, he's showing you how he's right, telling you for real, or here, grab something from right here, right there, and then we'll use this to try to figure out how we're going to do it to see how to move <laughs> for real. Pushing the net around, trying to teach him how to dig into the edges. We wound up grabbing a goal post one day, and I just was moving with the goal post. And to see him actually pour that into his little brother. My little brother, you gonna be nice. You gonna be playing logging and not playing for real, because he's younger. He just like it because it's something different and it's still fun. And if he get nice in it, he knows somebody, one of our brothers that don't play that ain't nice, so he can beat them in it. So for him to be the little brother to beat an older brother, he he feeling good regardless. We talked amongst ourselves on the board. We was like, what are we going to do now? We can't just feed them into the world without preparing them. So we uh, started to bridge to independence. We can help them through uh, guidance and counseling to uh, be independent parts of society, productive independent parts of society. As the sessions went on with, with Savage during the BTI meetings, you can see he started opening up. He started sharing a lot of, uh, lot of problems and, and things that he's going through in his life. I, didn't, I really came... I came from a And I lived on this block for a couple of months. Because I was put out the house and I had nowhere to go. And I mean, even if, uh, so, uh, even if you really needed somewhere to go, if it's not, if it ain't got nothing to do with the next person, Ain't got nothing to do with the next period, for real. And it's never supposed to have been like that, though. It's not supposed to be like that, for real, for real. That's why you got to make the best of it. You know what I mean? Make the best of what you got. After joining the, uh, the program, the BTI program and the, and the hockey program, I think he saw himself being able to do whatever he wanted. I think he felt like if he can learn hockey, that he can learn anything. The Baltimore Banners Ice Hockey Program has helped me a lot, along with some friends, too, that I know that helped. Tavon, Ronald, Saquon, Ray, Peanut, Daryl. It helped a lot of us. Honestly, it helped a lot of us. And I wish we had more programs like it. You know what I'm saying? I wish other people could look at us like, okay, they is trying. It was keeping me out of a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble for real. For real. A lot of people died. I was at high practice and got to call somebody on the block, died or 
something for real, for real. And it just, if I wasn't at that spot at that time, I probably could have been the one that died or something. Defense, get our end. Make sure we always keep one guy in front of the goal. Okay? You gotta protect the front. That's where they score from. Alright? So talk. Alright? You don't need to this corner, but stay in front. Okay. Alright, all right, guys, let's play hard, right? Cool. I'll come back in here when I win. I got you, honey. It's all good. I got you, honey. I got to make sure you good every time I see you. You know this. One day, coming from the Squeegee block, we walk to the gas station. I knock on the glass, asking for the gas station, man. I'm trying to get him to change me up for my change. I see somebody that I know walking. in. She walk in. She get to asking me questions. She all like, uh, where black at? One of my minds for real. I'm like, I don't know where black at. So long story short, I'm like, man, chain me up for my chain. What's taking you so long? What's taking you so long? Turn back around, I see two boys for it. Uh, not back on the glass. Yo, yo. Turn back around. They whip the gun on him. Try to reach for it for real. He moved it back. She all like, <laughs> tried the joint click. Point. The trick take her off. He tried to run off the first time. She all like, no, nah, grab his phone, grab his phone, grab my phone. And then they take off. Long story short, I'm just trying to trying to succeed in life. I'm saying I didn't say what the fallback looked like. I say I say what can cause you nothing, and I know what can get you this and get you that. I think what inspires me most about Savage is just the way he pops back up when he falls down, like, and is smiling the entire time. Savage started out with lots and lots of problems, but he never gave up. He just kept pushing. And I think, I think he's starting to realize that that's a skill that can be applied off the ice, too, because you're going to fall down, you're going to mess up. But if you let that discourage you, you're never going to do what you want to do. But he pops right back up and gets gets right back to it. He has that spark of something in him that means he's going to make it. His approach to life is what's going to make a difference. Whatever you do, be the best at what you do, for real, for real. You know what I'm saying? You want to do that, it don't matter what it is. Be the best and do what you got to do. As long as it's going to get you right, have your food on the table, have your people's good at the end of the day, that's what you got to do. Hey, Savage. Once you remember... You can do anything you put your mind to it. Just constant will to keep getting better and keep going. It's it's awesome. And I want to see wherever you go in life and be there for whatever you do. So give it You are an amazing young man, and I think that the sky's the limit for you. I think that you have all the tools to do whatever you want to do and keep working towards all your goals, and you will see that you're going to get everything you want in life. I know that. You know that. So let's do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. I told you I was going to get my degree. Good
Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome back. And uh, thank you for joining us for those two wonderful films. My name is Nancy Proctor. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at The Peel and Founding Director. Um, and we're trying to keep this program within what may be your lunch hour, so I'll try to be brief. But I did want to share some information on how you can follow up on the great stories we've gotten to hear today. And also thank everyone who made today possible, including you all who joined us for the screenings. Um, as always, it's been a great honor and pleasure to share these important Baltimore stories with you today. And in fact, this is our mission. The Peel is a home for Baltimore stories based in the oldest museum building in the country. We're currently renovating the 1814 Peel Museum Building to serve as a platform for Baltimore storytellers in all media. That is to say, the artists, the griots, the performers, the historians, the architects, designers, students, and educators. And we want to be a showcase that recognizes the importance of the contributions of these creatives to the city's uh, heritage. You can find out more about our campaign to save the Peel and Baltimore's stories at thepeelcenter.org slash campaign. And I think my colleagues are kindly uh, pasting that link in the uh, chat that where you can see it now. Um, our mission at The Peel is to amplify, share, and preserve the authentic stories of the city with a special focus on the voices that are too often unheard and overlooked in the cultural record of the city. So I'd like to thank Miles Banks, Tony Mendez, and all who collaborated in preserving and sharing the stories of Baltimore squeegee entrepreneurs, Savage and the Baltimore Banners hockey team by making the films we saw today. I'm particularly grateful to Shantae Daniels, executive director of the Baltimore National Heritage Area, whose vision and sense of responsibility to ensuring that all of Baltimore's stories are heard inspired the first film we saw today, as well as today's events. Back in 2019, when once again, Baltimore squeegee workers were in the news and the political spotlight, Shantae approached me saying she wanted to make sure that they weren't just talked about, that we, but that we would all have the opportunity to hear their stories from the squeegee entrepreneurs directly. And the Peel was honored to be part of the advisory team and presenters for the film. It was the first film by any means necessary that created the connections with the Tender Bridge and the G300 squeegee squad that led to the making of the second film, It's Not Just a Game, about the Baltimore Banners and Savage. And I'd also like to thank Savage, Michael, and Noel Acton of the Tender Bridge, who've worked with the Peel's artistic director, Jeffrey Kent, to pilot a new workforce development program based at the Peel. Just one of the many legacies um, of the importance of telling this particular story. Both of these films were huge hits when we first premiered them, so we're really grateful for the opportunity to air them again and provide another chance for these voices and stories to be heard. I do encourage you to check out Miles Banks' other work um, at JustStuntProductions.com. I'd also like to thank uh, today's transcriber and ASL interpreter, as well as the whole Peel team, David London, and also Robin Marquis, Maya Wilson, and Heather Shelton, who worked with LaDawn and others at BNHA to make this program a success. And you too can play an important role in amplifying Baltimore's voices and ensuring these and other stories become part of the narrative and the heritage of our city. So please support Baltimore National Heritage Area and the Tender Bridge with your donations towards their great work. Um, you'll find the uh, links to their websites in the chat here. And you can also find out how to support Baltimore storytellers and our work at the Peel on our website. Um, as well as sign up to get answers to any questions you have about this program, the films, or, or anything else related to today's event um, by subscribing to get our weekly newsletter. Um, so you'll find, again, a link to that in the chat now. So I think that um, brings us in just under the hour. And uh, I will pause for a moment in case there's anything I've forgotten to mention. Um, that my colleague David London or anyone else, John Tay, would like to jump in and say. Um, and if not, with that, I will thank you all again very, very much for joining us. Um, we're delighted to have you part of the audience. We'd love to have you part of the team as well. So do get in touch. Um, we'd love to hear your story. We'd love to have your support. And um, going forward, we, we know that you too are a, an incredible important part of this story of this city so uh thanks for joining us bye-bye